Intellectual Heritage Program at Temple University, where she teaches the required general education great books courses. She received her PhD in comparative literature from UCLA, where she has taught a number of survey courses on world literature. She has authored a chapter throughout uh, by uh, Brill, a famous publication, next year on the politics of literary publication in 20th century Armenia. Her other publications include articles on Armenian film and diaspora, published in the syndicated column Critics Forum, and translations of Armenian poetry and drama. She's currently working on a book project, Resistant Postmodernisms, Writing Post-Communism in Armenia and Russia. Uh, today, as you can see uh, from the title, uh, she's going to be speaking uh, about the place of post-Soviet Armenian drama in world literary studies. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dusyan. for inviting me. I'm uh, ecstatic to be here. I'm thrilled. Um, and a collective thank you also uh, to Turaj, Vahe, and uh, Sylvie for the work you're doing here for Armenian Studies. I really appreciate it. I think we all do. Um, <clears throat> I begin with a title that incorporates, at least at first glance, a bit of a misnomer the place of post-Soviet Armenian drama in world literary studies. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, Armenian drama has no place that we can speak of in dominant discussions about world literature. That is to say, literary production in Armenia is quintessentially peripheral in that it doesn't affect the discourse on literature. It is only affected by it. So my talk today is inspired by a set of disciplinary questions. How does one approach research on Armenian literature without simply taking the received knowledge about Euro-American or Russian trends and applying it to the Armenian canon? How can research on Armenian literature engage with global literary models when the trend in literary discourse is a move toward inter interdisciplinary studies which oftentimes leave no room for the smallest disciplines. I will take you on a somewhat long journey so that I may then propose one possible approach through the example of Armenian drama. First, I'd like to talk a bit about two recent books that present theoretical approaches to the study of world literature. They are Franco Moretti's Distant Reading, which came out just last year, and Pascal Casanova's The World Republic of Letters, published in translation by Harvard University Press in 2007. These two works represent the continuation of a trend in literary studies that can be traced as far back as Goethe's favoring of the concept of world literature over the narrowness of individual <coughs> national literary traditions. Moretti and Casanova want to be able to speak of a unified, denationalized world literature, independent of the political boundaries set by nation states. Their move toward the unification of literary space shares an affinity with contemporaneous theories that advocate the unification of mankind and the erasure of imaginary racial, racial and cultural differences. However, scope and intentions aside, Casanova and Moretti employ Eurocentric methodologies in tracing the development of literature. Their center periphery models that they use do a disservice to non-Western literatures that are simply outside the author's realm of knowledge. The respective foci Moretti and Casanova take as given hold true only when we don't ask questions about how and why certain literatures become marginalized by the way in which these authors conceive of literature as a global system with its own inner workings. 
it becomes incumbent upon scholars of national literatures to use their expertise in order to complicate claims about the universality of denationalized literary canons and spaces. Franco Moretti explains the motivation for his comparative project. By limiting its focus to the study of individual, mostly West European national literatures, the discipline of comparative literature has not lived up to its potential. So uh, because uh, Moretti sees uh, the impossibility of reading everything as a problem in theorizing about world literature, uh, he proposes uh, an approach he calls distant reading. So he takes Western European narratives as a standard and then uh, hypothesizes about how literature functions in various languages that he doesn't know. Um, and he asserts that uh, he doesn't have to read, be able to read these texts. So the problem I, that I have with his argument is that he's taking uh, the Western European narratives as, as a standard, and so he can, when he's looking at other traditions that he doesn't know, uh, the only thing that he'll find is what he's looking for, what he's familiar with. Um, so Moretti, Moretti defines a literary system that is, quote, one and unequal, and he writes, the destiny of a culture, usually a culture of the periphery, is intersected and altered by another culture from the core that completely ignores it. So in this case, Armenia or Armenian literature would be on the periphery, altered and, and intersected by cultures of the core and completely ignored by those cultures of the center. Uh, he elaborates on this law of literary evolution in cultures that belong to the periphery of the literary system, which means almost all cultures inside and outside Europe, the modern novel first arises not as a, an autonomous development, but as a compromise between a Western formal influence, usually French or English, and local materials. Much has been said in, object, in objection to the systematization of literary study that Moretti proposes. Scholars have shown that the periphery also has cu culture-altering agency, but Moretti ignores the impact of peripheral cultures on world literature in the name of comparison. And so he writes, you become a comparatist for a very simple reason, because you are convinced that viewpoint is better. It has greater explanatory power. It's conceptually more elegant. It avoids that ugly one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness, whatever. The point is that there is no other justification, and this is still him, for the study of world literature and for the existence of departments of comparative literature, but this, to be a thorn in the side, a permanent intellectual challenge to national literatures, especially the local literature. If comparative literature is not this, it's nothing, nothing." End quote. I will show, conversely, how a national literature can be a thorn in the side of comparative literary studies that attempt to theorize universal literary value. But before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pascal Casanova's uh, The World Republic of Letters, which is another uh, probably more pro problematic uh, texts. Um, I'll try to ad lib here a little bit. So the book talks about uh, the importance of Paris um, as a cultural center and a center of literary consecration. Um, uh, and in it, Pascal Casanova um, creates a binary opposition between what she calls autonomous literatures, literatures that are not tied to a national space or identity, and national literatures. So she has this uh, opposition that she creates, and she values autonomous literatures 
over and against national literary spaces. Okay? And of course, Paris is the ultimate model of, de of a denationalized uh, literary space for her. Okay? Uh, so it is, it is uh, the ultimate example of the universal, universal literature and universal literary production. So a couple of, um, uh, one quote from her. Um, so in her schema of small languages, um, which I, I refer to as uh, the most symptomatic example of the problematic nature of her discourse, she commits the violence of relativity. So here's what she writes. Next come languages of ancient culture and tradition associated in the modern era with small countries, such as Dutch, Greek, and Persian, that have relatively few spe speakers, native or polyglot, and though they have a relatively important history and sizable stock of literary credit, are unrecognized outside their national boundaries, which is to say, unvalued on the world literary market." End quote. Dutch, Greek, and Persian histories are relatively important, but relative to what? Whose history is the standard? Here, Casanova's discourse arguably nears Orientalist conceptualizations of civilized versus uncivilized cultures. It is according to this type of logic that literature gets taught, the logic according to which decisions are made that determine what every college student has to read, it is the logic of canon formation. It is also this type of logic that a peripheral tradition like Armenian literature can challenge in radical ways. I'd like to turn to a specific example in the genre of drama and the theater of the absurd. When I began my research on post-Soviet Armenian drama, I decided to focus on absurdist plays, partly because I found that they, there were quite a few of them produced during the late Soviet period and the entire first post-Soviet decade. Among the considerably long list are three plays that I took into consideration, Alasi Aivazian's, the now late Alasi Aivazian's, De Corner, Props, Berg Zeytunsyan's Zenvele Umahatsel, Born and Died, and Hurkan Khanjian's Averat Neri Bahaknere, The Guards of Ruins. There mu wasn't much written about these plays. Some commentators have noted in passing that absurdist plays of the European tradition were not available in Armenia until the late 1970s. And as a result, Armenian authors only had a real opportunity to experiment with this theatrical convention in the late Soviet and post-Soviet periods. This type of literary history remains problematic in that it places Armenian cultural production in the position of catching up with the West. Furthermore, it is not enough to say that the boundless freedom in the arts after the collapse of the Soviet <coughs> Union finally allowed Armenian authors to produce anti-realistic works in the form of absurdist plays. Certainly, these plays emphatically reject ideologically motivated art and therefore could only be produced in the absence of censorship. However, there must be something about these plays that specifically speaks to and about the post-Soviet era of independence. The plays do not merely offer an opposition to the formerly imposed socialist realist aesthetic, they also comment on contemporary realities. That is, they must have something new to offer to the existing conversation about the theater of the absurd. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that existing conversation um, about the theater of the absurd is. Um, and I'm hoping that um, as, as I talk about that, you will see that uh, the Pascal Casanova and Moretti models serve as sort of um, macrocosmic models of what I found in arguments about the theater of the absurd um, in, in Western and Eastern Europe. I decided to look at the body of scholarship produced over the last 50 years on the theater of the absurd. 
I felt that I had to do so in order to better situate the Armenian plays, the contemporary plays in question. The conventions of this tr tradition had been described in 1961 by Martin Eslin in his foundational work entitled The Theater of the Absurd a book that has since then come out in three editions, the latest one in 2001. In it, Eslin catalogs the traits of absurdist plays. And so these are um, that you don't get um, psychologically developed characters. Uh, you can't tell what's going on with the plot. Um, instead of having a clear beginning, middle, and end, you have a lot of cyclicality. Things are repeated. So the audience is oftentimes left wondering what in the world is going on here. It's a very metaphorical plot. Um, and, and the point is oftentimes very unclear if there even is a point. Okay. And so uh, Martin Eslin charts this out for the first time for us in 1961. Um, and so alongside the unifying characteristics, uh, or unified characteristics he observes in absurd, absurdist plays, Eslin emphasizes the unique qualities of the individual texts. And so he writes, by its very nature, the theater of the absurd is not, and never can be, a literary movement or school. For its essence lies in the free and unfettered expo exploration by each of the writers concerned of his own individual vision. The dramatists of the theater of the absurd are, each in his own way and independent of the others, engaged in establishing a new dramatic convention." End quote. As I will, sh I will show, Eslin does not always follow his own advice in his approach to interpreting absurdist dramatic works. Instead, he succumbs to the urge to co compartmentalize the text into subcategories that effectively erase the uniqueness of the individual plays. When actually followed, however, Eslin's recommendations would enrich our readings of these plays by pointing to the broad range in their approaches to subject matter and form. According to this type of approach, only an in-depth analysis that considers the specific contemporary context of the Armenian plays in question would do justice to their uniqueness and individual characteristics. I found that beginning with Martin Eslin's work, readings of absurdist plays exhibit either a fair amount of tension in their discussions of political interpretations, or simply a reluctance to commit to such interpretations. Introducing Armenian plays into this conversation allows for a reconsideration of the political engagement of the theater of the absurd. Inspired by the historical moment from which they stem, these plays highlight anxieties in redefining Armenia's position on the global stage. Props born and died and the guards of ruins observe the powerlessness of man and specific, specifically, allegorically, they relate this powerlessness to Armenia's position vis-a-vis -vis world powers. In other words, they suggest the futility of being an independent nation when the source of power lies elsewhere. The now almost cliché fixation of the theater of the absurd, the anxiety of man, finds a parallel in the anxiety of Armenia's status as a nation state. The aforementioned ambivalence toward political readings of the theater of the absurd probably stems from the lack of what we might call historical realia in these plays. For example, as Eslin points out, quote, in the late 1940s, Beckett so thoroughly rejected the naturalistic theater that to use even the name of a town that could actually be found on a map would have appeared as unspeakably vulgar. Similarly, Ionesco made it clear that in his theater, the social content is incidental, secondary. In many absurdist plays, man's accidental circumstances of social position, historical context, and time become irrelevant and therefore non-existent. Non-existent, excuse me. At the same time, however, the absence of a concrete time and place makes various political, religious, and historical readings possible. 
The play's metaphorical content is relatable, relatable to a host of specific contexts. Paradoxically, the lack of specificity in terms of historical realia has made it possible for audiences and scholars to read the plays simultaneously as political and apolitical texts. Eslin's description of Ionesco's relationship to politics offers a telling example of this very dynamic. And so he writes about Ionesco's um, uh, work, which is cat categorized as uh, Western European, part of the Western European tradition. All of Ionesco's theater contains two strands side by side, complete freedom in the exercise of his imagination and a strong element of the polemical. <clears throat> Ionesco's plays are a complex mixture of poetry, fantasy, nightmare, and cultural and social criticism. In spite of the fact that Ionesco rejects and detests any openly didactic theater, he is convinced that any genuinely new and experimental writing is bound to contain a polemical element. Here, Ionesco's rejection of singular, definable meaning does not preclude engagement with socio-political issues. Similarly, the lack of social content does not necessarily preclude political relevance. Despite his acknowledgment of the complex interrelation between socio-political critique and abstract indecipherable references and dialogue in the absurd. Throughout his book, Eslin places emphasis on the messages of absurdist plays that apply to, quote, the absurdity of the human condition. Sometimes he does so at the expense of the specific, however subtle political content of the plays. And so I have a, a, a kind of a lengthy example here. I'll, I'll, I'll just describe it for you. So you have um, a, a reference to a swastika in a, in a play by um, Ionesco called The Lesson. Um, and he chooses, he reads a, the reading that another uh, critic gives um, who reads the symbol of the swastika as a symbol for uh, dictatorship. Uh, Eslin takes this and says, well, yes, there is this reference, but uh, this is more about a, a, a general power stru uh, struggle um, uh, and, and in his reading, the, the specific phenomenon of a dictatorship um, shifts and, and he discusses it as a general power struggle uh, that all humans can relate to. Okay. Um, he, does, he, does, uh, he makes a similar move in his readings of Genet. Um, and I'll quote from him on Genet. Genet's theater is profoundly a, so a theater of social protest. Yet, like that of Ionesco and of Adamov before his conversion to epic realism, it resolutely rejects political commitment, political argument, didacticism, or propaganda. In dealing with the dream world of the outcast of society, it explores the human condition the alienation of man, his solitude, his futile search for meaning and reality. So you see in the quote how he starts by saying it's a political play, but then he ends with uh, the human condition, okay? So he's, he's, he is very reluctant to commit to a political reading um, of, of the uh, particularly Western theater of the absurd. Uh, and so we see that uh, because Eslin is sort of the starting point, um, his viewpoint it becomes appropriated, is appropriated by later critics who are reading the absurd. Uh, and so uh, we get um, quotes, uh, for example, that are completely devoid of any, any um, recognition of the, the political messages of the absurd. So uh, I have one here for you. Uh, so this is a later critic thinking about the absurd. Absurdist drama is ultimately conceptual, for in the end it too seeks to project an intellectualized perception, however oblique or abstruse, about the human condition. Um, and so 
Eslin's assessment becomes the basis for related readings that draw that come to draw an artificial line between uh, the West European tradition and the East European tradition. Um, and according to this type of criticism, the plays of Beckett, Ionesco, and Pinter, representatives of the West, um, focus on metaphysical themes that represent the human condition, while those of Václav Havel and Slavomir Mrožek um, from Eastern Europe present political protests against totalitarian systems. Uh, and so I quote, for example, the absurd of West European drama is the absurdity of existence. Socialist absurd is the absurdity of the bureaucratic system, of the problems of daily life. Uh, and so you, you're just going to have to trust me that this goes on and on, and it, it's, it's reiterated in um, uh, many different ways. And even with critics who are trying to refute this binary, um, you know, I, I, I find uh, by the end of trying to refute it, they end up reinstating the binary. Okay, um, so I have um, quotes like that that I'm going to skip. Um, I think it's important to note that there's this huge gray area in the metaphysical readings and the political readings of this body of, of drama. Um, and, and, and this gray area suggests an inherent politics of the metaphysical in absurdist plays. In other words, the purportedly universal concerns of literature cannot be devoid of the political. Or universal literature, as Shumei Shi puts it, was always a construct of power in the existential reality of differences. So universal literature is just a construct. Recognizing these tensions in interpretations of the plays of the theater of the absurd helps to do away with the already trite and embarrassingly elitist notion that universality in art lies in the West while political art is for the rest of the world. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about one of, one of the plays, one of the Armenian plays that I've worked on uh, by way of an example um, to show that while, while, the, while the Armenian plays develop, they do develop existential concerns, uh, they focus primarily on the problem of a power struggle. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, props. I have a little synopsis for you. The play is set in emptiness where four unnamed men, uh, the first man, second man, third man, and fourth man, try to make sense of their location. Disconcerted by the emptiness that surrounds them, they call on the prop manager offstage to help them create a place. After the prop manager brings in the furniture and walls that they re request, the men find that they are dissatisfied with the result. The place does not turn out to be what they had envisioned. They feel entrapped by it. They ask for the furniture to be removed, and then they find themselves feeling uncomfortable in emptiness once again. This pattern repeats four times. Each time, the men ask for different props to fill the emptiness, and each time, they are dissatisfied with the outcome. In the end, the men decide that they need a ceiling in order to have a bona fide place. The prop manager has his stagehands lower a ceiling onto the set, but the ceiling never stops coming down and eventually crushes the men underneath it. It's a very happy play. <laughs> With virtually no references to Armenia or Armenians, the play can be read as an abstract meditation on the human condition. But it can also be read as an allegory for Armenia's political situation in the late Soviet and post-Soviet years. 
The characters interpret the emptiness on stage as the absence of place, and their struggle to change the setting to create a place becomes the central conflict of the play. The text emphasizes the concept of place so much so that the word place, del, and words with this root, for del, es del, where, here, are repeat, repeated 24 times in the first 23 lines of the play. The opening stage directions highlight the contrast between the two concepts, emptiness versus place, that trouble the characters. Um, and I quote, this is my translation, only the center of the stage is lit. The surroundings are dark, creating an illusion of infinite emptiness. The first man stands center stage looking around. He gropes at the surroundings with his hands, but finds emptiness. He moves forward, moves right, gropes at the surroundings again and again, and keeps finding emptiness. The description of the first man's search for something to grasp in emptiness immediately creates the effect of his displacement. The character's dislocation and emptiness corresponds with their lack of identity. They are nameless, nameless as I said, uh, and they lack distinguishable traits. The play's focus on a spatial problem as it relates to individual identity suggests that greater forces control both the characters and so too, allegorically, the nation's fate. The themes of identity and place allow the play to broach the subject of national politics indirectly. The characters frequently connect place and politics in their utterances. As the fourth man explains, we don't need anything else, just a floor and a ceiling, and also freedom. The four men rely on the prop manager, to whom they beg and plead for help in their attempt to create a place for themselves. But every time, with the help of the prop manager, each scene chain result, change results in the creation of settings of confinement, such as a jail and a madhouse. In this way, the action of the play symbolizes the great game, the power play between the Russian and Euro-American powers for the Transcaucasus, and particularly Russia's maneuvers in the game. Each scene change represents the promise of a new order, but ultimately all changes bear the same futile results. The characters remain uncomfortable and in their existence and constantly look to the figure of authority in order to situate themselves in their place and time. Uh, so alongside this very political bent, and I'm doing an intentionally political reading of the play, there is also a spiritual bent. Um, the play's introduction arguably resembles the beginning of creation myths like Genesis, Genesis and Hesiod's Theogony that begin in nothingness. The play's conclusion suggests a further connection with Genesis and the fall of man. After the ceiling has been installed, the four men begin to wax philosophical in a state of elation. The fourth man says, quote, human thought consists of the meaning of life. He uses the word panagam chun, which implies thought, mind, thinking, and judgment. Its root pan, word, or logos appears again later when the men begin to utter their own renditions of lines from the Bible. Significantly, as the fourth man expresses the idea that panaganuchun is at the core of life, the ceiling starts to come down on the men, unnoticed. In his last utterance, the first man says that if he were to write the Bible, he would begin, in the beginning there was righteousness. All of the characters proceed to repeat this idea. The idea that in the beginning there was righteousness replaces the idea from the book of John that in the beginning was the word. The word has clearly failed the four characters in their quest for a place, and perhaps it needs to be replaced by the more spiritual concept of righteousness. Moreover, the men's exclamations about the greatness of God at the end of the play indicate what they are missing throughout its action, namely spiritual sustenance. However, the dialogue proceeds with an entirely absurd style, the character statements are unrelated to each other, 
no conclusion is reached, and the words flow like an endless train of illogical speech. As a result, it would be rather difficult to prove that the play makes a clear statement about religiosity. Instead, we might simply say that Probs is concerned with the possibility of a higher power. While the play's turn toward questions of religion can be read as a resistance against the atheism of the Soviets, this precise moment of religiosity is coupled with destruction. The fact that the references to God and the Bible preface the moment when the ceiling crushes the four men does not support a positive interpretation of religious ideology. On the contrary, the conclusion reaffirms the idea that all ideologies, religious and political, and the types of rhetoric they espouse are flawed. The men in their final attempt at establishing a place turn to the rhetoric of humanism and religion, but just as the rhetoric of Marxism, independence, and democracy failed them, it too proves ineffective. Throughout this last thematic shift in the characters blabbering, they remain fixated on the politics of reform that characterized the late Soviet era. Certainly, the words the fourth man utters speak to the spirit of Gorbachev's reforms. So I have the Armenian for you. Um, it's supposed to sound funny. Azaduchun, azada peramuchun, patsahosuchun, patsatsainuchun, azadamaduchun, pazmahosuchun, pazmagarzikuchun. And so they're chanting these terms. Um, my English translation, which also sounds funny, it's supposed to. Freedom, free speechness, open speech, open voice, freedom of thought, polyvoiceness, dialogic. The rhetoric of glasnost, the late Soviet equivalent of freedom of speech, is rendered absurd, useless. With the fourth man's conclusion that freedom signifies place and existence, the play re reiterates the parallel between the lack of place and the lack of freedom even in the very end as it simultaneously explores and rejects the existence of a higher spiritual order. Uh, through this very brief reading of props, I hope it felt like it was brief, uh, I sought to present the multi-layered complexity of absurdist plays. It is in a similar vein that Berdze Tuntian's Born and Died and Kuken Khanjian's The Guards of Ruins carve out a unique space for themselves in the subgenre of the theater of the absurd. All three plays, though each in its own way, propound a power struggle as it relates to the play's setting. Their action revolves around the spatial questions of power. What will the characters make of their setting? Can they set and govern the terms of this setting? And who has agency here? It follows then that the place or stage building that takes place in these plays functions as a metaphor for Armenia's post-Soviet nation building. The political messages of these three plays speak to the vulnerable position of the tiny nation of the Transcaucasus for centuries. At the same time, in conversation with the Euro-American tradition that preceded them, these plays create an occasion to rethink the trends in the scholarship on the absurd. They offer a clear indication of the in-betweenness that characterizes this type of drama, between tragedy and comedy, between existentialism and the spiritual, between ideolo ide ideology excuse me, and the ap apolitical, between national history and the history of humankind. If we were to follow arguments that affirm binaries like the categories of the universal and the national, we would simply place some Armenian absurdist plays under the category of a didactic, politicized national theater, while others might be considered to have a more existential, universal bent. But it is precisely this type of binary that an analysis of Armenian drama can challenge. In approaching existing scholarship with a hint of skepticism, it becomes possible to free Armenian literature from the grip of Eurocentrism, while also explaining the reasons why an entire body of scholarship that has gone before us 
should be reconsidered. And this, is the, and this only becomes possible when one recognizes the need for a critique of notions about universal literature. It is now fitting to return to my title and the place of Armenian drama, or more broadly speaking, the place of area studies and national literatures. Their place undoubtedly is a thorn in the side of Eurocentric models of world literature. Thank you. I'll take questions and a sip of tea. <laughs> The play that you told us is almost like um, Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, atheistic existentialism in struggle against Danish philosopher Kierkegaard's religious existentialism. And it appears to be atheistic existentialism winning over the religious existentialism. What do you think? I think that's definitely there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so with my reading, what I'm trying to do is say that all those things that we're familiar with from the um, European canon um, inform the play, but its specific historical context also informed, so, so that it is really a complex play. There is that parallel of anxiety within these four characters in Camus, no exit when three of them, they create the triangle and there is no solution. And this sounds very similar to it. I haven't read that book, like what you said, but it's very parallel, the no exit, the existential struggle, trying to find out, and, uh, and at the end, atheistic existentialism crushing over, literally in this case, over uh, religious areas. and maybe it was uh, appropriate at the time for whoever wrote this book to be able to survive in Soviet era and uh, not to be uh, pushed on the side. Right, yeah, so um, a little bit about the, the context of uh, and when the author wrote the play. Um, so certainly, indeed, the, the author has um, is philosophizing about um, religion and atheism, um, but also, you know, he is quoted um, uh, as saying that this play was in inspired by the earthquake um, in Armenia, and um, so, so these notions of emptiness and um, the need to rebuild and reconstruct. Um, are what I'm, I'm reading into in order to tie it to the politics of the nation as well. But certainly that's there, the, the existentialist questioning. Yes. I have two questions. Okay. The first one is, what are the ages of these three writers? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Kurkan Hanjan is in his 50s, I believe. Uh, so he's the youngest. Uh, Ber Zeytunsyan is the oldest living one uh, in his 80s. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm kind of cheating here because he shouldn't be included with authors like Avasi Ayvazyan and Kulkan Khanjan because he's a very... Um, Conventional author, okay, um, usually, but he has this one unconventional play, so I'm grouping him uh, alongside them because it is an absurdist play. It's one absurdist play that he has written. Uh, and Avasi Ayvazian passed, I think, in 2002. Mm. Now, my second question most Armenian, most literature written in Armenian, which I would say Armenian literature, is Armenian, right? belongs to Armenia. Are these uh, uh, three plays, would you consider them uh, universal? What not I, what not I'm really, to truly, Armenia. you know, Armenian? No, no. Um, what I'm trying to, what I try to show is that universal 
the category of universal of the universal is an invention. So and it depends on who is setting the standard. Okay? So the Western canon tends to consider itself to be universal and the standard, uh, and therefore reading for everyone. Uh, whereas the smaller peripheral um, literatures and canons um, are deemed and designated as national traditions. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm trying to wage a war against that, those notions. Um, yes? yes I have a <coughs> question, but I, first I want to really thank you for, the, for your presentation, also for the reading of the plays, because it's the first time I'm in the States I'm actually attending a lecture where we're reading these plays. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Uh, I have a question about the plays themselves. Um, did you, is it possible to think of this also, maybe possibly that these plays, uh, oh, maybe I can formulate this as a question. Do you think that uh, <coughs> the plays, despite their absurdity, do nevertheless either engage in universalist discourse, which kind of can accuse them of doing so by, let's say, buying European metaphysical, maybe, concerns? Or do you think they also are in between, in the sense that they also challenge the very notion of the very notion of nation, while being in Armenian language, but not necessarily essentially national play. So two yeah. related questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to rephrase the first question. Yes. Um, but uh, in response to the second question. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that's a very interesting suggestion. Um, you know, the, the plays are grappling with um, how we make meaning uh, and how language functions and the failures of language. Um, and all of that speaks to how we construct the nation, um, right? Uh, and so perhaps uh, the pe pessimistic endings um, can be regarded as um, symbolic of the failure of the nation. If I may, the first question was, um, the plays are concerned not thoroughly about metaphysics and maybe universality in their own way. Are they sort of complicit or do they fall into the trap of universality, even though they are trying to be an absurdist play, uh, to tr trying to be a play that is, let's say, about humanity in general? In other words, can we like do a post-colonial reading, in a, in a different sense, maybe, of the plays? Um, I think it's it's not possible to answer collectively. Um, so, for example, "Born and Died" is a very self-conscious uh, play, and it is a play that that actually um, endorses the Eurocentric. Um, visions of Armenia and, and says to its audience, so this is part of the, the script, um, you know, wake up, you only like realistic theater, um, you're so backward, um, you need to catch up with the West. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, it's like Berze Tunsian has read Moretti and Casanova and he, is, he has put them into a play. Okay, um, so and I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> and then maybe criticize the plays as it were for... Yeah, and, and so, but there is also this um, desire to, to they, they, I, I do believe that the plays want to distinguish themselves as, as different. And um, I witnessed this um, uh, when I, uh, I actually performed in props. Um, I way back. Those really? yes. Okay. <laughs> way back when, and we had the the author um, uh, fly in from Yerevan, and he was present at one of the um, performances, and someone asked him um, if he was inspired by Beckett and Ionesco, and he completely rejected it. He was so offended that he might have been inspired, that his work may have been inspired by Beckett and Ionesco. Um, so I think they, they are, in a sense, even though maybe they are complicit, they are um, trying to carve out literally a new space. Yes. This brings up a follow-up question. Uh, one, 
Uh, when were these written? Were they written at the time before the Soviet Union fell? Or after? And then the second question, as you mentioned about this last uh, comment about the playwright uh, rejecting Beckett or uh, were these three authors ever exposed to outside outside of Armenia? Did they always live in Armenia? Did they travel outside? And what type of other story, other plays they wrote? I mean, one of them you said was a conventional writer and one one of sort of one of these plays and you know, and then, what about the other two? Did they what is the body of their work? So okay. and what's the uh, okay. like two questions, I guess. Okay. So, um, the first question was about dates, so I'll cover that one, that one's easy. Um, so Alasi Ayabazian started to write uh, props in 1988, so the, the very end of the Soviet period, but it came out in publication in the post-Soviet period. Um, and it was never performed until uh, it, it, it was performed in LA in, uh, I think it was 1999. Um, so that's Ayvazian. Uh, Ayvazian was a very, very prolific author. Um, he even has screenplays, um, prose, and drama, um, and a very, very uh, diverse body of literature that he has produced. Um, Berzi Tunsian, oh, and he would have probably traveled, um, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was born in Georgia. <laughs> Uh, you know, he would have traveled throughout um, uh, Russia, Russia and the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Um, Berzi Tunsian wrote the, his play, uh, Born and Died, in the 90s, 1994. And um, uh, The Guards of Ruins is a later play around 2000. All of these authors very well translated into other languages other than English. Um, I don't know if that answers your question completely. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, sense of it. Thank you. Right, may I another question? Mm -hmm. Doesn't this is another follow up, but in a different direction? Doesn't the fact that these authors are translated into other languages other than English? show that there is agency and action in the periphery, Absolutely. but that's ignored by the same the English language. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, English is um, notorious for not, not translating well. You know, the, the Russian authors that I read, they're translated into the contemporary Russian authors, okay? Translated into every language. Uh, they're translated a decade later in, in so we're really behind because we don't need to be ahead, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Was there any reference in Kazanova's books on Armenian literature or any of You know, I think she mentioned Armenia or Armenian once, but I can't remember it. It's a, it's a thick volume, maybe 500 pages. Uh, I think she mentioned it once. I can't remember. It wasn't. It wasn't significant. There it was about Charles Aznavour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe she said something like Ad Adamov's uh, background is Armenian or something. Mm. Something incident. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.